Welcome, welcome, welcome to the working that is Chrononaut Chronicles. My name is Bill, and I will be your guide on this particular sonic adventure. The show is, of course, sponsored by mysticalwares.com, which is Derek Condit's metaphysical supply shop uh, based out of Mount Vernon, Washington. So there is a brick and mortar uh, spot you can go and check out, uh, but definitely check out the website and see what he's got going on there. He's quite a busy man lately, uh, so he won't be here with us today. I am joined by one other chrononaut, Adam. Uh, so uh, thanks for being here, Adam. Hey, dude, thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's been uh, more than a week since our last episode, which happened uh, last time, but uh, life just sometimes gets gets in the way. But we uh, are needing to survive and all and not, you know, turn into a, a frostbitten ice cube. An icicle. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been shoveling wood into one of our fireplaces here to keep warm. Uh, uh, let's see. We did that for three nights, I think it was, until we got our heater situation furnace repaired. Right. So. Was this an excuse to cuddle? Oh, there was lots of lots of cuddling. All the animals uh, were were uh, very friendly and wanting warmth as well. So yeah, um, busy though because you know tending making sure the fire is going is. I mean that takes takes commitment, right? If you're just using wood to heat your house with, especially if it's a large house. But uh, anyway, yes, that uh, that actually ties into my gratitude. <laughs> But uh, what is, before we get into that, what is it that we exactly do here on Chrononaut Chronicles? What is the point of the, of the working? And it is, it is pretty open-ended in that uh, the goal is to anchor in whatever your most highest and best uh, timeline is for, for yourself. And the bulk of this work is done in the, the sword segment. It's done outside of the show, right? Uh, we, we're just here to kind of uh, uh, provide a... a uh, system of steps, I guess, which is why we call it a working. Every spell working has parts, steps to it. So there are four of those to this to this particular one, which would be the almanac, gratitude, silver, and the sword. And uh, the goal behind each particular step, right? The almanac is we're just using this to to look up, basically, to expand our awareness, see what else is going on in in the universe. Maybe give us a little bit of mindset of where we are in relation to everything else, and if there are any. Uh, you know, energies that uh, we want to capitalize on and work with. And then uh, moving on to the second step is gratitude. I mean, this being a working love is, is a pretty, pretty big, uh, pretty key ingredient. So uh, the goal behind this is to uh, connect our hearts and our minds and to create that uh, frequency and to stretch that into infinity, right? So it's not just once every while when we get together on the show. And then uh, the third segment is the silver segment, and this is where we get into expansion, right? We try to learn something new, and uh, this oftentimes involves current events which in which we look for the silver linings, right? And maybe sometimes it, it's, uh, it, is, it is just that this too shall pass. But uh, for this episode, we're actually going to continue on in our profiles in wizardry. We're going to cover uh, blue wizardry today with uh, Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter. And then uh, this leaves us with the last step or segment, which is the sword segment. And this deals in, in matters involving uh, spirit, dimensions, metaphysics, timelines, consciousness, transformation, how to navigate uh, the world we find ourselves in, uh, efficiently and effectively with our thoughts, right? And uh, pretty much uh, timeline management. This, this is a uh, reminder that we have a choice, right? There are no victims, only volunteers here. So with that being said, let's take a look at the almanac. Kind of a busy week. Uh, Tuesday, oh, we're actually recording this on Sunday, so a little deviation from our usual Monday recordings. But uh, yeah, this coming Tuesday will be the new moon, which is uh, also conjunct with Mars. And Mercury actually happens to station to go retrograde until January 1st of next year. So buckle up for some Mercury, Mercury, Mercury retrograde. 
season. And then uh, let's see, Thursday we have Venus conjunct with the moon. Friday is Pluto conjunct with the moon. And Saturday, Sunday, I'm sorry, Sunday is uh, the moon and Saturn are conjunct. Uh, just some interesting other tidbits provided by the Almanac. Uh, this coming Saturday is the anniversary of the Boston Tea Party in 1773. And then on Thursday, there's something called Halcyon Days, which begins. It's H-A-L-C-Y-O-N, something I had never heard of before. So I looked it up, and uh, it's uh, Halcyon Days, uh, which have come to mean any time of happiness and contentment, which are actually the 14 days around the winter solstice. And according to Greek legend, the Halcyon, or Kingfisher, built its floating nest around the 14th of December, during which time the gods calmed the seas for the nesting and hatching time. So, a little bit of Greek mythology there. And that uh, pretty much does it for the almanac segment. Uh, moving on to gratitude, as I've mentioned before, heat. My gratitude is heat. We spent, uh, I think the tech made three three or four trips out here, um, replacing part after part. So minus the, the engine, the, the motor in our fuel oil heater, um, we've got basically a whole new system. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that I don't have to uh, continue to buy firewood, even though I live in the woods. A lot of it is pine and not really. Oh, so no wonder you have to shovel it so often. No wonder what? You have to shovel it so often and kind of really keep an eye on it just because it's not a super dense yeah. uh, wood that's just going to keep that that deep ember going. Yeah, and I got you. You want hardwood for that. Basically. Exactly. So I did. I mean, I did drag in some pieces from our wood pile that are hardwood and had them dry out in the third stall of our garage for a few days and was able to use some of those to supplement. Yeah, you don't want to get a real pie. smoky, wet smoke. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm glad that was. I'm glad that's over. Basically, I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to be back here doing another show. So, what? Uh, Adam has a big. I think a big. If if he wants to, uh, a big announcement regarding uh, a certain sigil that we might have put in place. Oh um, yeah, yeah. The work the work sigil has uh, succeeded. I am now back, or I will be. I finally got all the paperwork and uh, background checks and what everything uh, through. So, yeah, I will be starting next week. Awesome. So I didn't mean to preempt your gratitude, but that uh, that counts in my book, right? <laughs> no, that is my gratitude. So uh, right on the money. Awesome. Um, speaking of being on the money, not to uh, toot my own horn or anything, but I did... We uh we did do a little remote viewing experiment, and uh, we have yet to I haven't released the foot or the the audio from it yet. But uh, Adam and I had a pretty successful um, trial run, I guess. At least I I think so. But uh, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Maybe surprising uh, results, oh, yeah. but unsurprising for a first time. Um, it's there's so many experiences where. Um, it's like riding a bike, you know, the first time you do it, you, you're going great. It's easy. You've all of a sudden actually done it. And that's when you realize your dad ain't holding on to the back seat, you know, and it's like, oh, I'm doing it. So, um, early success like that, where it's, uh, mind boggling or gobsmacking. And I don't know, I, I was super impressed. Um, but yeah, that, those kind of results are common. So you as the listener can do it. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I'll publish that, that footage. I keep wanting to say footage that uh, what do you. Yeah, that audio. And it's not difficult. Yeah. Basically, you're just going to calm your mind and relax. Everything will be described, but it's very simple and concentrate on the target and write down what you see. And yeah, give yourself like, you know, 15, 20 minutes to participate. And you might be very surprised if you. Uh, hell. 
see if he can't kick Bill's butt. <laughs> yeah, so I'll I'll probably pu- publish that audio later on, especially as we try to figure out our new recording uh, schedule. I guess with with the uncertainty of you know schedules for day jobs going forward, right? So, um, we'll do my best to keep it a weekly thing. I uh, might do some solo shows. Don't really know yet, but uh, just fair warning. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess that brings us to the silver segment and, uh, we're going to do another class, like I said, featuring a blue, a blue wizard, uh, tonight, Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter. But before we get into that, I do believe that Adam had something else he wanted to bring up and uh, share with us, which I don't know anything about. So yeah, well, no, great. it was just a tag on to the, uh, remote viewing See if you wanted to uh, dive into something a little simpler, a little more obtuse and abstract um, that confused you at first, but I think might might interest you now. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's do it. All right. So normally in remote viewing, so I don't know if the listeners will be able to hear um, what we did the first time or this, um, but essentially remote viewing is taking the time to put yourself in an environment with no distractions and using either silence, something soft like a fan or static, brown noise, pink noise, um, something to allow you just to focus um, focus on having a clear mind. And that's all you want. And then um, normally um, somebody would designate a target. In that episode, we designate a target. You could focus on the target numbers, letters over and over again, a unique string that's going to string you to the results listed of the target that we were going to show. Now, there's also examples of doing like um, detectives using remote viewing on the job, but using blinking. So meaning their target is now in their mind of the information I need to solve this case. So I don't know where the evidence is. So as I'm walking around crime scenes, I'll be looking around and whenever I blink, that is my cognizant, my target ID is I'm going to be blinking on important information. So now I look at something and I instinctually blink with that onomatic response. Boom. Now that object's my target that I was looking at. So in the same way, I'm going to give you a target. Um, I push this show out a little later for a very particular reason. And I want you to do a remote viewing on that reason, on what I was doing right before we came on to the show. Okay, that's interesting. Right? Okay. So it's a little more, so you know, what do you want to see? What are you going to try to remote view? You want to know what I was doing right beforehand. You kind of know the time frame. You know, like everything in progression. You know the actual event to go through to time to be able to find this location, this event. You don't have to know where I'm on a map, but you have to know I'm looking for Adam. You know what I mean? I'm looking for him before you're doing this. And one of the beautiful things that seems to pop up in remote viewing is things that are more important or things that are trying to be held secret um, tend to glow brighter and be easier to focus on. So um, I've already given the importance and attention to it. Um, So I'm interested to see what you would come up with in five or 10 minutes of Uh, Just sitting down, clearing your thoughts as much as you can um, and writing down whatever you see. And for the listener, you can participate in this as well. Um, Just visualize myself at that time. That is your target. But do you want, you want to, are you talking about doing this now or? Yes, right now. Okay. Um. I can attempt that. Should we, we can just leave the recording going, right? Yeah, we'll leave the recording going and you can come back. I'll put myself on mute. I won't talk or do anything else. Um, And just like we've talked about on the previous remote viewing, your focus is not on analyzing anything that comes through. You're just trying to focus on that target and let all the information come through with no analytical overlay something pops up, just try to clear your mind out and get to thinking of just not processing the information, receiving it. Okay. Any smells, thoughts, ideas, visuals, shapes, anything, just put it down as much of it as possible, even if it doesn't seem important. 
Okay, I can give it a go. Um, I will say that we do have company over here and it's not a quiet or conducive environment. To That's do fine. So, so you <laughs> have an advantage, Bill, because you could do one of two things. You've got a very good set of headphones and you've got some binaural beats, some brown noise and pink noise. So you could always just relax yourself in your chair, dim the lights, close your eyes, and or even just cover your eyes. You know what I mean? Just It doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to be able to find yourself in that zone of of focus without analyzing okay and, so. okay so i want to say one more thing too because of the noisy environment joseph McMon mcmonagle who we've spoken about on this show before prefers to do his remote viewing now while he's doing other things like watching the news or things like that where he's focused in another place with the things he's doing and then able to still be in that space so i don't recommend this to most people but it's to say that just because there's interference or sound coming through don't let that deter you because it's certainly not a deal breaker you just don't let it influence the thoughts all right let me go find some paper and then i will uh i'll sit down for 15 minutes whatever you want five okay. ten minutes and some of it can be comfortableness because i've had it happen before where i get to a point where i feel like it's complete and i feel like it's done and i feel like i've got it and then i'll take a break okay so again there's no right way to do this you're literally using an innate ability all you're doing is framing your mind to be able to focus in the right way so the exact time doesn't matter, but you need to have the focus. So I'd say anywhere between five and 15 minutes. Okay. I've I'll got just... all the time in the world, buddy. So, okay, cool. Yeah. I will, uh, I'll just pop back on here when I'm done. Sounds good. All right, cool. See you on the flip side.
Okay, I am back. Are you there? Yes, yes, I am. I put a picture into the chat of what I got. Um, I'll just say, Scott, without trying to be too analytical, something to do with assembling some type of object with a handle, boxy, something with corners. Um, yeah, don't. Uh... How's this? Just walk me through through um what you saw, just step by step. Well, the first little character in the top left corner there was some supposed to be something coming off of like the you, know, you have the surface and then you have the little hook part. It was, it was supposed to be like a handle, maybe of some sort, and then the next bigger two lines with just some kind of like clasp or buckle thing could be like a lid to a trunk or I don't know, something that separates two distinct areas, right? And then I got, I don't know, box came came to my mind and assembly and then this weird TP looking shape showed up. And then I kept getting, you know, just shapes, right? Like some of it made me think of the different like dice, maybe it could be D and D dice, which you know. Um, but definitely like corners, something because each of them had uh, different, had, like a different number of sides and a different number of angles and shit. But it was that's something that you know kept coming up. Towards the end, and only you know it's only been fifteen fifteen minutes or so, right? So didn't spend too horribly long on here. All right, well, walk me through any senses, sensations, visuals, colorings. Um, did you hear any sounds? You know, how did how did these shapes or how did this information present itself to you? Um, just behind my closed eyelids i guess um there was a slight twinge in my left like neck arm area that was i don't know bothersome um didn't last very long um there was a little bit of movement towards the end when i was seeing those shapes something like a i don't know throwing a ball off of a wall or something like that um and as far as colors man there were no no really vibrant, outstanding colors or smells. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. All right. Are you ready for your reveal? Unless there's anything else you want to add. Because once once the cat's right. out of the bag, you can't go back. Um. Yeah, I think that's about it. I think we covered it. All right. So, if you're a listener out there, spoiler alert, the answer is coming. Otherwise, pause. See if you can't beat Bill. Um, so, I'm sending you the pictures now. Um, the event that I was doing was dyeing Angie's hair um, pink. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely didn't get any pink. And so I just sent you some pictures of her hair and some pictures of the equipment and the pieces that I used to do the dyeing itself. Did you send them? Uh, to your phone. To my phone. Oh, okay. Still waiting for this. And if you would like me to take any different photos or closer ups, let me know. Hmm. 
Hmm. Okay. A lot of pink going on there. So, yeah, there's a Arctic Fox bottle and then mix yep, which has a pink lines. fox with a very long tail then you've got a pink bowl that's shaped kind of like the half of a ufo um or like a salsa dish with a long cylindrical with a giant point on the end pink brush and then two hair clips which fulcrum in the center and the center of it has an opening it looks like a buckle and you wrote clasp lid and the little TP you drew does look like that clasp when it is opened. Okay. I can see that. Right? Because it pops up. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm So it is possible, you know, if we were, you know, you could be completely off, but if I was like looking to draw any correlations on yours, from what mm -hmm. I can tell, um, you know, you might be describing the clip. Because if you kind of look at the top of the clip, um, that's in the image that I sent you, the pink one there, um, that does kind of have the same shape of that long horizontal drawing that you drew. And then right below the image, if you clip and open the clip, it's going to have that same scissor TP like shape with that triangular triangular end on the end of it. Interesting. And as for the dice, the only thing that I might correlate is um, the patterns on the um, the side of the oh, uh, right. dryer that I was using is polka dot, pink polka dots. And if you're looking at that, it does have the same structure, even though it's a giant grid of the polka, the dots on a dice, whether it be three in a row, four in a row, oh, six in a gotcha. row, you still do have that, like seeing that dot figure um, predominantly on two sides of the equipment I was using. I didn't send you a picture, but I also am wearing a uh, mountain I should say it's a mountain brand, but it's a t-shirt that's got a tie-dye purple skull on it. Or white skull purple t-shirt. Okay. Yeah, if I had to, yeah. Okay, so that's, this is uh, less of a hit than the first one, I would say. <laughs> right, but again, so let's talk about honing and saying, if I got things right, you know, um, how were you feeling during this? How were you feeling when you saw those things come through? You know, I know that you had put down that you had the idea of like a dice. You didn't draw the dots or the dice. Um, always encouraged you to just draw things out because sometimes I'll draw things and I'll end up drawing it in a way that's very different or I should say structurally a little different than my mind's eye. And the combination of those drawings or other drawings adjacent to it, sometimes I'll be like, oh my gosh without realizing it, I drew exactly the structure of what I was seeing. Yeah, that's what, ha well, I'm not the spoiler or alert or anything, but that's kind of what happened the first go around I had with the, the mm -hmm. placement of the objects on the... On Don't the say what it is. <laughs> so yeah, this is the listener if they want to do it again. So yeah, I would say, you know, uh, certainly not a fantastic hit, um, but if you keep doing it day after day and going, oh, well, you know, I had a certain feeling or there was a certain sense or there was something particular about when this information comes through or how I processed it less Then you could go. OK, well, there was something to there with the structure of the dice. And because if you look at those dots and you're just focused on those dots, what other things look like it? You know, that's a very easy thing to draw. You'd say like dominoes, you know, uh, dice, um, you know, polka dots. Right. Yeah. So pictures over words. I know I wrote down some words, but I don't know. It was just yep. Yeah. Because that's an analytical overlay. Because, you know, yeah. you're putting a corner. You've defined what a corner is. Right. Yeah. It was protruding. Mm -hmm. been, you, you know, like, you wrote handle. Well, what is the clasp doing? It's holding the hair down. It's it's, you know, holding it tight up against the other hair. You know, what does a handle do? You grab it with your hand and you pull it to these. You grab them, you squeeze them and you pull them off. So there are, you know, there are correlations, um, you know, to that. 
clasping a lid. A lid is usually on top. This was on top of her head. Um, but again, could be something that was completely washed out with analytical overlay. Yeah, still super fun to do, though. So, And not completely wrong, because at least you're getting some of the, um, you know, you did, you at least hit on some of the patterns that were present. You know, was it chance? Maybe, maybe not. The good thing is you do it over and over and over and over again. You get better. You get better. You start seeing it. Yeah, and, it, and like I said, it is a fun exercise to do. It gives you a little bit of a confidence boost, right? And uh, yeah, this is definitely, uh, if you haven't, something that we covered, and if you haven't, go back and listen to the Joseph McGonagall class that we did in, in gold wizardry, right? So this would be an example of a, a gold faction um, function, <laughs> faction function. But uh, leading into today's class, we're going to do we're going to move into a different faction we haven't covered before blue blue wizardry right so just a quick quick background on what these factions are right like why, why keep saying this word and what does it mean right um this is a a, a schema right a worldview that is put forth by azazel in in telegram and essentially is a classification system for uh white hats and black hats essentially right everybody knows black good guys and, and bad guys right so so we have uh, blue gold and, and green versus the the red or or the black hats bad guys so blue deals uh, blue wizardry would be, would be dealing in space mountains and, and water uh, gold wizardry is spirit dimensions uh, time travel metaphysics consciousness and green wizardry would be surface and subsurface basically uh, subterranean warfare and then uh, versus the black what are, are the red red would be who are the reds the, those are the occult deep state illuminati cabal you know adrenochrome people right so um it's finally got kind of like a, 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 a three versus one scenario right and uh back in 1982 there was a movie released called the flight of the dragons it is an animated film and uh, all four colors are explicitly mentioned in the movie. And the movie uh, allegedly is used to teach about the colors and factions. And uh, I believe I can link to it in the show notes. So maybe just uh, click on click on there and uh, give it a give it a, a watch. It's a, it's a chill child's film, right? But it's just to introduce uh, the concept and. Uh, you could think of it as a training film, right? Um, kind of like predictive programming, but not. But but it is. <laughs> you watch it and let me, you let me know what you think, right? So am I doing that now or later? No, no, no. It's it's a movie. It's movie length. Like it's a feature oh, film. Gotcha, it's, gotcha. it's yeah. It's is you know, you know, professional production and uh, animators and whatnot. But uh, yeah, so without further ado, uh, Wizard of the Day is Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter. He he was a navy, you know, in the navy. So this is classified under blue wizardry, and uh, allegedly part of the Majestic Twelve um, program committee um, project. There we go. Which the FBI concluded was bogus, but we'll get into. Magi 12 in a moment. Uh, but first, just some basic background information on Roscoe Henry Hillencotter. And all this can be found on Wikipedia, I believe. I'll include the link. Uh, but he was the third director of the... Okay, so we'll, we'll go through, just to lay out the structure here, we'll go through uh, the background, and then uh, there's a YouTube clip which I will play, which goes into more detail about um, his involvement with the events in his life. <laughs> so uh, going into you know the world wars and, and all that stuff, and then we'll get into um, Legacy Space Force, Solar Warden, and 
uh, some Ronald Reagan uh, disclosure after that. So just a quick snap snapshot of what we'll be covering here in the in the silver segment. So here we go. Uh, Roscoe Henry Hillen Cotter was the third director of the post World War II United States Central Intelligence Group, CG, CIG. The third director of Central Intelligence, DCI, and the first director of the Central Intelligence Agency, created by the National Security Act of 1947. He served as DCI and a director of the CIG and the CIA from May 1st, 47 to October 7th, 1950, and after his retirement from the United States Navy, was a member of the Board of Governors of National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena from 1957 to 1962, NICAP for short. He was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, on May 8th, 1897, he graduated from the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland in 1919. He served with the Atlantic Fleet during World War I and joined the Office of Naval Intelligence in 1933. He served several tours in naval intelligence, including as Assistant Naval Attaché to France, Spain, and Portugal, which we'll hear more about in a moment. During the Spanish Civil War, he coordinated the evacuation of Americans from the country. After the German invasion of France, Helen Cotter entered Vichy, France, and aided the underground movement. As executive officer of the USS West Virginia, he was wounded during the attack on Pearl Harbor and afterwards was officer in charge of intelligence on Chester W. Nimitz's Pacific Fleet staff until 1943. He briefly served as commander of the destroyer tender USS Dixie before joining the Bureau of Naval Personnel in 1944. After the war, then Captain Hill and Cotter commanded the USS Missouri in 1946 before returning to his pre-war posting as naval attaché in Paris before becoming head of the CIA in May of 1947. President Truman persuaded a reluctant Helen Cotter, then a rear admiral, to become director of Central Intelligence, DCI, and run the Central Intelligence Group, September uh, 1974, or 47, excuse me. Uh, under the National Security Act of 1947, he was nominated and confirmed by the U.S. Senate as DCI, now in charge of the newly established Central Intelligence Agency in December of that same year. Uh, at first, the U.S. Senate Department directed the new CIA's covert operations component, and George F. Keenan chose Frank Wisner to be its director. Hill and Cotter expressed doubt that the same agency could be effective at both covert action and intelligence analysis. So we have the first director of the CIA saying that uh, maybe this isn't such a good idea for one agency to do both of these things, but yet here we are. Uh, anywho, as DCI, uh, Helen Cotter was periodically called to testify before Congress. One instance concerned the CIA's first major Soviet intelligence failure, the failure to predict the Soviet atomic bomb test, uh, August 29, 1949. In the weeks following the test, but prior to the CIA's detection of it, Helen Cotter released the September 20th, 1949 National Intelligence Estimate, stating the earliest possible date by which the USSR might be expected to produce an atomic bomb is mid-1950, and the most probable date is mid-1953. He was called before the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy to explain how the CIA not only failed to predict the test, but also how they did not even detect it after it occurred. Uh, that committee members were steaming that the CIA could not be taken, or that they, that they could be taken by such surprise. Helen Cotter imprecisely replied that the CIA 
knew it would take the Soviets approximately five years to build the bomb, but the CIA misjudged when they stated, quote, and this is a very confusing quote, so it's not my fault, but we knew that they were working on it, and we started here. And this organization, CIA, was set up after the war, and we started in the middle, and we didn't know when they had started, and it had to be picked up from what we could get along there. This is what I say. This thing of getting a fact that you definitely have on the exploding of this bomb has helped us in going back and looking over what we had before, and it will help us in what we get in the future. But you picked up in the midair on the thing, and we didn't know when they started up. Or, end quote. So, pretty confusing, right? Um, the committee was not satisfied with Helen Cotter's answer, and his and the CIA's reputation suffered among government heads in Washington, even though the press did not write about the CIA's first Soviet intelligence failure. The U.S. government had no intelligence warning of North Korea's, excuse me, North Korea, Korea's invasion, June 25, 1950, uh, of South Korea. DCI Helen Cotter uh, convened an ad hoc group to prepare estimates of likely communist behavior on the Korean Peninsula. It worked well enough that his successor institutionalized it. Two days prior to North Korea's, Korea's invasion of South Korea, Helen Cotter went before Congress, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, testified that the CIA had good sources in Korea, implying that the CIA would be able to provide warning before any invasion. Following the invasion, the press suspected the administration was surprised by it and wondered whether Helen Cotter would be removed. The DCI was not influential with President Harry S. Truman, but Helen Cotter insisted to the president that the director of, that as the director of central intelligence, it would be politically advantageous to testify before Congress and to try to remedy the situation. So after the testimony, some senators told the Washington Post that Helen Cotter confused them when explaining the CIA did not predict when North Korea would invade by saying it was not the CIA's job to analyze intelligence, just to pass it on to high-ranking policymakers. Even though most senators believed Helen Cotter's uh, ably explained the CIA's performance, many of the CIA were embarrassed by the news reports, and by mid-August, the rumors of his removal were confirmed when President Truman announced that General Walter Beadle Smith would replace him as DCI. President Truman installed a new DCI in October, uh, and Nebraska Congressman Howard Buffett alleged that Helen Cotter's classified testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee, quote, established American responsibility for the Korean outbreak end quote, and sought to have it declassified until his death in 1964. Uh, Admiral Helen Cotter returned to the fleet, commanding Cruiser Division 1 of the Cruiser Destroyer Force Pacific Fleet from October 1950 to August 51 during the Korean War. Uh, he then commanded the 3rd Naval District with headquarters in New York City from July 52 to August 56, and was promoted to the rank of Vice Admiral on April 9th, 1956. His last assignment was as Inspector General from the Navy, or of the Navy, from August 56 until his retirement from the Navy on May 1st, 1957. Almost done, bear with me. The National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena was formed in 1956, with the organization's corporate charter being approved October 24th. Helen Cotter was on N NICAP's board of governors until about 50, from about 57 to 62. Uh, Donald E. Kehoe, NICAP director and Helen Cotter's Naval Academy classmate, wrote that Helen Cotter wanted public disclo disclosure of, US, of UFO evidence. Perhaps Helen Cotter's best known statement on the subject was in 1960 in a letter to Congress, as reported in the New York Times. 
quote, behind the scenes, high ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about UFOs, but through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense, end quote. Helen Cotter lived in Weehawken, New Jersey, following his retirement from the Navy until his death on June 18th, 1982 at New York City. That's two years. We have seen a... at New York City's. Sorry, I had a technical hospital. malfunction. Sorry, Bill. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, actor Leon Russum played Helen Cotter in an episode of Dark Series, a 1996 conspiracy theory television series. And lastly, Helen Cotter was awarded the Submarine Warfare Insignia, the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit Bronze Star Medal, the Victory Medal, the Second Nicaraguan Campaign Medal, the American Defense Service Medal with Fleet Clasp, the Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal with two Battle Stars, the World War II Victory Medal, the Navy Occupation Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, the Korean Medal, uh, sorry, the Korean Service Medal with two campaign stars, and the National Nation, uh, the United Nations Korea Medal, and the Officer of the Legion of Honor, France. Ooh, so that is uh, pretty much all that Wikipedia has, has to say, I believe, on Helen Cotter. So, oh yeah, you can't see, excuse me. Adam, you can't see my screen here, but I'm just reading off of the Telegram news feed, and it's got this nice little meme of meme, I say, picture of him with his quote um, in the CIA insignia above it. it. says, through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. And this is from the New York, New York Times quoted, right? Quoted in the New York Times, February 27th, 1960. And then he provides, he uh, Azazel provides two links to the CIA.gov library, which uh, are not working. So I won't bother including those. Um, there is an obituary in the New York, in the New York Times uh, referenced as well. There are two uh, YouTube videos, one of which does not work, but the second of which I have a uh, clip prepared and, and pulled up for us to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, his exploits over over in Europe as the naval attaché. Uh, so this is about 20-ish minutes. And uh, this is a from a talk given um, at the foundation, the, I'm sorry, the Institute of World Politics. Um, by Richard E. Schroeder. Uh, he's a PhD and an author. Uh, he wrote a book about the formation of the CIA and the Missouri Gang. And the Missouri Gang is, was, well, he'll explain it here in a second. But uh, yeah, like I said, it's about uh, 20 minutes long. Uh, it is recorded during, like, live. So you'll hear, like, weird clicks and background noises from the, from the audience. And uh, his audio is is a little not as good as this so just just bear with it um there's some pretty interesting stories in here so i will uh, i will mute and uh well, we'll hit play officer in the 1920s here you have roscoe hillencutter who was from st louis he is the uh, son of a post german american postman so real blue collar background as opposed to Sowers, who was uh, very, very wealthy indeed. And Hill and Cotter and Sowers, both naval officers along with Mighty. <laughs> then you've got Floyd Vandenberg, who was the nephew of a, a very prominent and powerful Michigan Senator, Walter Vandenberg, who's the Republican chairman of the Senate International Relations Committee or Foreign Affairs Committee. Then you've got Mark Clifford, businessman from, um, from Kansas City, who at the end of the Second World War, as a junior naval officer, it's also in the Navy, by the way, 
uh, was serving in the White House, in Truman's White House, in the, the what was called the uh, mat room. So that was basically the 1940s equivalent of the Situation Room. So he was one of the intelligence briefers. He was a lawyer and he became White House counsel who was uh, instrumental in the creation of the CIA. And finally, you have another Missourian, Larry Houston, whose father was the president of Washington University in St. Louis. And Larry Houston was also a lawyer, worked for the OSS, and then became the general counsel of the CIA. So Clifford and Houston worked together to create the CIA, basically. We're first going to start talking about uh, Hill and Cotter, but make one last point about the Missouri gang. I call them that not because they were corrupt, but because that was the name that Truman's political enemies gave the people around him to sort of remind people that he had come out of that corrupt political environment. Although I'll have to say that Truman was probably one of the most upright uh, presidents we've had. Here's Helen Goddard, uh, graduated from the Naval Academy uh, near the top of his class at the end of the First World War, too late to actually serve in the war, uh, had service on a couple of very famous battleships. This is West Virginia, you're going to see again later, and this is Missouri. Harry Truman's favorite battleships. So I said he was a St. Louis native. Um, for some reason, he was extraordinarily gifted in languages. And he has left very few footprints. So it's really challenging to find out very much about him, about his personal life, about his thoughts, and so on. Although at the end of his career um, and at the end of his life, he became spectacularly famous for something you won't even imagine. Uh, he was uh, a teacher of, of Romance languages at the Navy Academy in the 1920s. He served as a staff officer and he served on battleships. And then in the early 1930s, he was assigned as a naval attache in Paris. And this is the point at which, as far as I can see, you get the first generation of what I would really call professional intelligence officers. People who um, may not have been as well trained as we have been with the CIA, but who did a very good job of doing all of the missions and tasks that intelligence officers, especially field intelligence officers, are supposed to do. Now, remember, as a naval attaché, he was not a clandestine officer. He was not undercover. He was exactly what he pretended to be, which was a naval officer. Uh, and um, he collected, he reported, he analyzed. And once the war started, he also got involved in operations. You may not remember with all of the crises we're having these days, but the 1930s were a very dramatic and crisisful time in Europe. For one thing, you had, after 1933, a resurgent, aggressive Germany, creating what they called the Third Empire. And you had the Spanish Civil War, which was basically a preview of the Second World War, in which the fascists, the Italian fascists and the German Nazis, tried out their new equipment and their new technologies against the Soviets. You had the Russians on one side, and you had the Nazis and the uh, fascists on the other side. And the Spanish Civil War was going on right at France's doorstep. So Hill and Cotter, as a military attache, would make trips down to uh, Spain to report on the new techniques and equipment that was being used. Basically, Hermann Goering was testing out the Blitzkrieg, and he was testing out air war against the, uh, the Spanish. Uh, beyond that, uh, the Germans were illegally recreating their army. They'd been forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles in 1918 to reconstitute a large military. So basically what they did was they used the same method that, that we used for the Civilian Conservation Corps, and they <laughs> had the, the labor service or the Deutsche Arbeitsdienst. And that was 
during the depression, recruiting young people to uh, do public works projects. Now, you may have children or grandchildren or grandfathers or grandmothers who served in the Civilian Conservation Corps during uh, the 1930s. My father-in-law was in the CCC here in the United States. And most of the post offices and county seats and national parks can thank the CCC for a lot of the construction that went on. But our CCC guys did not march with a goose step in uniform, and they weren't using shovels as uh, substitutes for rifles. But Dylan Cotter, as an American attache who spoke essentially native German, made a probe down the German frontier along the, the uh, east side of the Rhine River as the Nazis were building up their forces. And he would just drive along. He would pick up hitchhikers who were either labor corps boys or soldiers. He would give them cigarettes and he'd say, what are you guys working on? And they would say, oh, we're building this airfield or we're building this fort here. We're doing uh, that there. And he made a, uh, a remarkably uh, fruitful probe of the frontier there. He was the last guy allowed to do that because immediately after his trip, the Germans forbade any military or military retirees who were foreigners from going into that area. Aside from that, of course, the Germans are expanding uh, the borders of Germany, first with the Rhineland and then uh, incorporating Austria and then pressing the Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia. And there were repeated war scares in France uh, where panic would set in and people would flee from Paris by <laughs> the tens of thousands. This picture, by the way, is a very interesting one because you see the dogs underneath the cart there. This is, I think, the inspiration for an interview that was given by one of Hill and Cotter's uh, embassy friends in Paris, um, Douglas MacArthur II, who was a nephew of General Douglas MacArthur. And he was in Paris at the same time and he gave an oral history interview to the Library of Congress where he describes this exact scene of people fleeing with their dogs tied to the bottoms of the carts as they would just leave the city. Of course, they were, they were less than 20 years from the First World War when the Germans had almost gotten to Paris. So this was still very uh, immediate to them. Hill and Cotter remained in Paris when the Germans occupied. Uh, embassy dependents were evacuated from France, but Hill and Cotter and the Chargé, a, uh, a State Department officer by the name of Robert Murphy, remained in town along with the uh, army attaché, and they literally greeted the Germans as they marched into Paris. So Hill and Cotter was right there watching the Germans occupy Paris, and he was invited by the uh, the uh, military governor, German military governor, who had been an attache himself, a German army attache himself in Warsaw. He says, come on in, have some champagne with us. And hey, listen, I used to be a military attache myself. So ask me any questions you want. I understand your job is to collect information. What do you want to know? And Helen Goddard says to him, how are you going to get to England? And, <laughs> and he says, don't worry, we got it all worked out. <laughs> So Hill and Goddard remained there in Paris. Um, France was divided with Paris under uh, German occupation and a rump government was set up in a resort town in Southern uh, France called Vichy, a spa down there. And a new American ambassador was assigned, Admiral William Leahy. And there he is, you can see all these medals. He was a retired chief of naval operations. And here we have Hill and Goddard as the naval attaché. Here, by the way, is Douglas MacArthur II. You can tell by the eyebrows that he's a MacArthur. Here's the army attaché, and then there's the assistant naval attaché. But Leahy became the ambassador to Vichy, and uh, basically what uh, Hill and Goddard and his army colleagues were doing was they were trying to get people out of occupied France. They were trying what we would now call exfiltration, to move people, um, Brits or Canadians or other people who were threatened 
by the occupation, trying to get them out of the country. Um, in Vichy, um, he was working with resistance groups. He would give them money. He would give them documents. So he he was doing a lot of a lot of uh, working to facilitate the preservation of a resistance movement in the very very early months of the occupation. Uh, uh, and the other thing he was doing, once Germany fell, or once France fell, once France <laughs> fell, the French had a very large fleet based primarily in the Mediterranean. And literally a month after the Germans occupied France, there was great alarm and concern about whether the French fleet was going to be used by the Germans or not. That's why they chose Leahy to be the ambassador. Well, Winston Churchill decided he was going to put the whole issue off the table, and the British Air Force and Navy attacked and destroyed the French fleet in their bases in July of 1941. This, of course, infuriated the French, who were already feeling that um, America, that the British had, had not been very good allies during the collapse of France. Of course, you know, in, the, in a situation where you've got two armies trying to work with each other uh, against a vastly superior uh, force with much better morale and much better equipment, basically the Battle of France was a rout. And the British were lucky to have escaped from Dunkirk by themselves, but that left the French with a lot of grievances, which only got worse once the British destroyed the French Navy. So Helen Goddard, who was basically the equivalent of a lieutenant colonel at that point, his job was to try to keep the French minister of the Navy, a, a senior leader by the name of Francois Darlande, from actively supporting the Germans. So you can imagine what a challenge that was to try to talk this furious Frenchman whose fleet had just been blown up by this supposed ally. And Helen Goddard's job was, no, no, don't support the Germans. Remember, you have to stay on the Western side. And he's arguing this at a time when the United States is by no means prepared to get into the war. So Leahy and Hillen Carter had quite a challenging job to do. This, by the way, is the period when Leahy really gets to know Hillen Carter, and it's going to be important later in the story. Hillen Carter, because he's done such a great job in uh, France, in Paris, and Vichy gets a promotion. And what could be a better promotion from a naval officer than to become the second in command of an American battleship? Literally three weeks before Pearl Harbor. Three weeks before Pearl Harbor, in the middle of November 1941, he is assigned as executive officer, second in command, the USS West Virginia, which gets blown up out from under him. Captain is killed. Helen Potter has to swim ashore, and the entire fleet is destroyed. And Helen Goddard, at that point, is given another critical job, which is he becomes chief of intelligence for Admiral uh, Nimitz, who is the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, such as it is. And during the six months after Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese are basically sweeping everybody ahead of them, and are occupying island after island, Wake Island, uh, all of these others, capturing islands right and left. Hill and Cotter is struggling to put together an intelligence group at Pearl Harbor, and he is struggling to put together a cryptographic program, which is going to break the Japanese codes. So they're doing all of the intelligence analytic challenges, which unfortunately the United States had not been very well prepared. So that's, that's what he does for the next few months. Now, at this point, I'll... Okay, so that will be the end of that clip for now. Um, I know I said it's going to be 20 minutes long, but I did put it on 1.25 speed. So a little less than 20 minutes. Uh, what did you think, Adam? Could you, could you hear it, first of all? It came through okay? and Yeah? Uh-oh, Adam, where'd you go? Where'd my Zoom screen? I was go? muted. Sorry. Yeah, no, it came through good. Yeah, I mean, those three-letter agencies, they're, uh, they're deep. Yeah, yeah. So this guy was a, a master of languages, 
essentially, right? Um, helped, you know, uh, taught language, right? And was helping to, to uh, decode the secret communications between Japan, you know, Japan was using, right? So uh, just a little bit of background on what exactly he did during his time in, in the Navy, right? And uh, some pretty interesting stories, especially about uh, him surviving Pearl Harbor. Like, that's that's freaking insane. <laughs> um, so I, I did share my screen there uh, when I after I started the video. So anybody that's watching on YouTube can go uh, see this this man talk and look at the pictures he was pointing out. Um, but back to the Azazel class, uh, he says that's that's it done on Admiral Hillencotter. And let's let's jump into some extra credit. We never tell the presidents the truth right away. Frankly, most are never cleared and most will never know the truth of the extent of the projects in the black world. The first inauguration of Ronald Reagan as the 40th president of the United States was held on Tuesday, January 20th, 1981. His second inauguration was July 21st, 1985. On June 11th, 1985, the Wizards granted Ronald Reagan an audience, meaning they waited four years to see if he was, trust was trustworthy to see behind the veil. And so we have this journal entry from the Ronald provided to us by the Ronald from the Reagan foundation.org right for uh, June 11th 1985 pretty short entry says had a group of Dem and Repub congressmen in the Roosevelt room for a session on why they should support the bipartisan bill before the house to give aid to the Nicaraguan freedom fighters I think we did some good lunch was with five top space scientists it was fascinating. Space truly is the last frontier, and some of the developments there in astronomy, etc., are like science fiction, except they are real. I learned that our shuttle capacity is such that we could orbit 300 people. Later in my office, one of the guests, Dr. Edward Teller, reported on where we are on our defense research for a way to halt nuclear missiles. The bad news is that our congressional advocates of lower defense spending are cutting our research funds at a critical moment that will be very hurtful to the program. We have house guests, Nancy's brother and wife, Betsy Bloomingdale and Maureen, a very pleasant dinner. They are all here for tomorrow night's state dinner. P.M. Gandhi of India. Read it again. Lunch was with five top space scientists it was fascinating space truly is the last frontier and some of the developments there in astronomy etc are like science fiction except they are real i learned that our shuttle capacity is such that we could orbit 300 people one of the top space scientists blue wizard present at this meeting was drumroll ben rich and ben rich is famous for being the second director of Lockheed Skunk, Skunk Works. Uh, but, however, keep in mind, this was 1985. Lockheed Martin did not exist. They had yet to merge with Martin Marietta. The spaceship they were describing in the Oval Office on June 11, 1985, was the USS Helen Cotter. Official date of commission is 1988. And uh, if you're looking on the screen here, I don't know if that showed up very well, but uh, here's an image of what the USS Helen Cotter looks like. It's a, basically a cigar-shaped cigar UFO. Oh, stop my screen share for a second. Get that back up. Here we go. There we go. Can you see that now, Adam? This is what yes, I can. USSS Helen Carter. So three S's. And uh, just reading the caption here, uh, data commission is 1988. It is a type classified interplanetary exploration spacecraft. Uh, purpose, 
Uh, according to famed internet hacker Gary McKinnon, these spacecraft are part of the Solar Warden program, and the U.S. currently operates eight of these ships. They are said to be a part of secret military space programs spearheaded by the U.S. Naval Space Weapons Division, MILAD. McKinnon found several files listing non-terrestrial officers, as well as ship-to-ship -ship transfers, with ship names that didn't exist in the U.S. Navy, namely the USSS Hillencotter and the USSS Curtis LeMay. One of the photos he managed to view was, in his words, above Earth's hemisphere. It kind of looked like a satellite. It was cigar-shaped, and it had geodesic domes above, below, to the left and right, and on both ends of it. Although it was a low-resolution image, it was quite close up. These crafts are said to be longer than two football fields placed end-to-end -end and nearly as long as an aircraft carrier. Combined with testimony from MyLab rural whistleblower Corey Good, who's been in the news recently, got some legal trouble, uh, regarding the Solar Warden ships, uh, we are able to piece together a possible look and feel of the ships they both discuss. Given that the program would have begun in the late 80s, it's reasonable to assume it would look something produced by a joint venture between all the top aerospace manufacturers at the time, Lockheed, Northrop, Boeing, and British Aerospace. I am absolutely not surprised. I mean, I personally believe that there's a secret space program. We know there is. You know, the youth, the uh, the Air Force has operated one for a very, very long time. We have Space Force, all these other things. And all we know is the X-35B and, you know, SpaceX, the uh, previous space shuttle, all these things that, uh, I don't know, man. I'm pretty sure they got the good stuff out there. Absolutely. So imagine, back to the Zazel class, he says, so imagine being President Reagan. Suddenly you are told the truth about the Solar Warden fleet. The need to resolve the discrepancy between what he thought to be true and what he later learned to be the real truth. The state of mind we refer to as Solomon Syndrome hit him so hard that he even wrote about the experience in his presidential diary. And then so you can see uh, an example of one of the uh, screenshots here that McKinnon hacked, hacked, hacked out of the U.S. military database. And it's got a list of non-terrestrial officers. Um, it's got a list of ships, including the USS Helen Cotter, um, USSS Helen Cotter. Some of the other names, though, are pretty interesting. Um, it says that the, the Helen Cotter is a the class is a destroyer and it says it's a prototype level two whatever that means right this is some kind of like spreadsheet excel excel spreadsheet that mckinnon got access to and this has been you know posted around the internet a billion times too so this is by no means new information to me anyway but i don't know just some of the interesting names on here like corvus like that's a that's a const that's a crow constellation um it's got cassiopeia there's another constellation ophiuchus which is a fighter class, says so the status is operational. And then uh, some of the, the non-terrestrial officers, um, these aren't alien officers, right? These are humans, right? They're, uh, for example, Carl Wilkerson, second lieutenant, aerospace engineering, right? So non-terrestrial just means that they're not on Earth, right? Um, but uh, some of the other specialties, like, like the, these would be uh, great... Uh, career paths to pursue if, if you're at that point in your life, right? Aerospace engineering, optical engineering, earth sciences, remote sensing, atmospheric... You just can't tell anybody once right. you know about it. That's the problem. You get to being on the cool tech and nobody gets to know. Well, that's, well nobody in the bubble world does, but if you get tapped on the shoulder, it's a whole other universe out there, right? But hard skills, basically, is, I mean... High vacuum theory, that's a so theory, uh, but atmos, um, earth and planetary sciences, aerospace engineering, astro astronautical engineering, electrical engineering, right? So uh, Azazel says, hopefully some of you are made of the right stuff to join the fleet. So I once again remind you, 
focus on skills, not on politics. It's all smoke and mirrors. An entire universe awaits you. Imagine what they are looking in recruitment for after open eyes happens. You can die on Earth to be divided and conquered, or you can impress the non-terrestrial recruitment officers, Legacy Space Force slash Solar Warden, enough that you've earned a spot in the honor of wearing blue coveralls. Class dismissed. So, I wanted to do a little bit more digging on Majestic 12. Oh, um, real quickly, Ben Rich, Skunk Works, Lockheed, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, right? We all know that that uh, famous quote, right, about getting E.T. back home, right? But it's referenced here in the class, so I'll just read it. We already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything that you can imagine, we already know how to do. So, pretty uh, pretty mind-blowing stuff. I mean, this is what, what the ontological shock... Technology to take you e. home. Yeah. Indeed. It makes sense. You're telling me we were able to, you know, go into outer space, go to the moon, have this massive space program, and then never again. I just don't believe it. Yeah, sounds pretty fishy to me. Um. So while we did cut that uh, PhD, PhD gentleman's cut uh, talk off early, um, he said that uh, Hill and Cotter was going to be known for something, you know, amazing or that you you can't imagine later on in the presentation. Well, I believe that that is just the tie-in to the Majestic Twelve um, project or whatever, whatever you want to call it, um, committee, I guess I don't know, but uh, I have. I have found the, uh, the on the FBI website their vault, um, the declassified document that they had in their possession about Majestic Twelve. Right, so I'm sharing my screen now, and I just thought it would be fun to kind of kind of go through it a little bit. Like, Adam, what do you do? You know what? How much do you know about Majestic Twelve? This is uh, in the UFO more than I most, so quite a bit. Okay. Um, do you want uh you want me to give my full yeah. opinion give up us, front? Give us the rundown right. and then I'll... So I don't and people out there are probably familiar with Stanton Friedman. Um he is one of the earliest, most prolific and most um what should I say, like uh solid with his credentials. Um and he fully believed that Majestic 12 was absolutely real. Now, the problems is people have gone and, you know, requested documents through Freedom of Information Act, got able to verify copies, you know, um, that they're getting the same documents and finding that there is forgery. There is obfuscation uh, to say that these documents um, are not real. Would you you could say that. But at the same time, what Stanton Friedman argued is that this is the classic UFO obfuscation that you do meaning you're going to pollute the pool with false information and real information. So if anybody starts coming on to the truth, you can start putting out breadcrumbs to both lead them off and then to discredit them. So in a situation like this, he said, look, yeah, absolutely. Some of this information, um, you know, was, you know, the documents are not what they say. You know, there's some uh, forgery lines and how the signatures were copied from other documents that have very distinctive marks and some things. But he says, but this document was created with such knowledge um, of the entire operation that a lot of the information is real, that there was a majestic 12, that there was a, um, you know, all these members to it and that they put this document out there with verifiably false stuff in it so that it would be um, found to be fake and then would further you know, uh, when people look at MJ-12 or projects like this, or if you listen to Richard Dolan, that MJ-12 is actually, I shouldn't say he says this, this is the inference that I make, um, that MJ-12 is actually um, speaking of a real program um, that was called the Zodiac, um, or as some people will refer to like the crash retrieval program, 
uh, within the government as the program. This was Zodiac, which is very interesting when you start to think that it, you know, uh, you also have 12, you've got, you know, the 12 signs, uh, you start getting into uh, astrology and all those other things. Um, it just makes it much more interesting. So uh, I find the Majestic 12 documents to be very interesting from the standpoint that a lot of effort and research was put into doing this. This was not just done by, um, you know, somebody willy nilly. This was likely done by a team of people with extreme credentials. And if I remember correctly, there's also some links back to Richard Doty. Um, so I'll say allegedly I'll know this, uh, but I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Richard Doty. I'm not. No. Oh. Richard Doty is a allegedly a uh, I don't know what you would call it a person who is put out there to purposefully put people off the scent or the trail to obfuscate. They're an interference agent. He was going to UFO conferences and befriending people and doing different things. There's a great documentary out there called, um, oh, I need to look this up. Majestic Men? No. Am I thinking? I'm... Hold on. This would be the Richard Doty documentary. Mirage men. So uh, the long end of the story is he convinced a scientist um, that we were being visited by aliens. He was a very smart guy. He was picking up on these radio signals that were being sent out, some sort of like, you know, frequency um, being detected. It was a secret military program. But instead of doing what they would normally do, where if a really smart like physicist or scientist stumbles upon what they're doing. They will bring them into whatever program they're working on. They'll take knowledge. You've really got a smart guy. He figured something out. Let's incorporate them. We don't have to worry about the secrecy. But instead, they convinced him that these were actually signals being propagated from aliens. And they set him up with special equipment to start receiving it. And long story short, they drove the guy insane and he, he killed himself. And so... Uh, he's tied up in the story of the provenance of these documents. Uh, so it's, to me, a lot of work was gone into obfuscating this. So you have two ways of viewing it. There could be partial information, or my favorite way of viewing information is, what are you trying to hide and what don't you want me to see? You know how I know there's that the the, the U.S. government has in its possession, um, bodies, biologics, and alien recovered equipment is because we put into the National Defense Authorization Act that if there was any non-human intelligence equipment or biologics that was being held by uh, the U.S. government um, or by private contractors, uh, that it needed to be disclosed and that it needed to be through public eminent, eminent domain be shared with the special UFO group so that they could then start allowing scientists to get access to it. That was struck down. That was pushed out of the UFO disclosure bill. Um, part of the National Defense, Au Defense Authorization Act, the fact that we're even having that conversation, they say, you know what? No, you don't get to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, you don't want me to see something. That's very specific. If there's nothing there, there's no reason not to let the investigation go on. And we can go through the list. You know, there's Bob Lazar, there's uh, Philip Corso, who wrote The Day After Roswell. Um, you know, there's, you know, seven or eight really good whistleblowers throughout history who have come forward and told us these things. You can even go through some of the more ancillary, like you mentioned, Ben Rich, or even listen to some of the things that some of the astronauts have said. In fact, if you really want to get interesting, and this is a little side note before we go into this, what I find fascinating is NASA saying, well, we're trying to, you know, Look at, you know, new information to find out if, you know, there's been any contact with, you know, any extraterrestrial life or the UAP blah, their, their study. And it's like, well, how about you don't, or how about you just look at all of your astronauts that have reported seeing things outside of the craft on the surface of the planet? This is a common occurrence for things to be seen outside of the vehicle that are not normal. So, um, Yeah. I pull a lot of validity into it from either of those two angles that there is obfuscated truth or is there is absolute truth. And either way, they're pointing towards 
the facts. Yeah, it's pointing towards a, a, a cover up of some of something of some variety. exactly. If you're trying to pull me away from the truth, well, I know the direction I'm being pulled away from. If you're showing me the bullshit, I see the bullshit. I know what that is trying to pull me towards. And through the inference of that, you can start to infer that you are being pulled away and what you're being pulled away from. So from that standpoint, this document was absolutely put out there to pull people off the tracks of UFO investigations. The people that were doing this, like I said, uh, was Richard Doty, who worked for the U.S. government. Um, but anyways, watch Mirage Men and... Uh, you will then start to realize why does the U.S. government have such a interest in infiltrating and manipulating those in the ufology community if there is no there to the there. Right. If there's no there there, why, why it's secrecy? Exactly. And you could also take it from what Bob Lazar said, um, where he was shown things in the, you know, um, tons and tons and tons of information but a common practice um within uh like sending somebody into a facility is you don't give them all the real information you give them a ton of information that's real and a ton of information that's fake for two reasons that way you know you can't really pull the whole picture together um it's less likely that people are going to believe you because there are facts in there that can't bear be verified and although i don't think it's a, this that uh, uh, the reasoning here it's also because you know bob lazar something he stated the aliens came from zeta reticuli well if all of a sudden a leak comes out that you know this specific information is mentioned well we know that this one personnel with this doc um you know knew this information therefore we know who the leaker is without even being able to find the provenance just based on the information so there is tons of obfuscation that goes on out there and um this is absolutely part of it I'm inclined to believe that there's a real program, something like Zodiac, um, that this was inferring to and that this is um, seeded with truth um, and topped off with bullshit. But either way, there's there's knowledge there, valuable knowledge. But anyways, Bill, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to poo poo it. No, yeah, no, it's I mean, this we're going to we're going to take a look to see exactly what the document contained and how the government got their hands on it and how it was uh, debunked, I guess, by the FBI. But apparently uh, just looking at the cover letter here from this uh, FBI report, um, the Dallas field office is sending this, this classified, uh, this, this majestic 12 document, which is just right here. We'll get to it in a second to uh, home office, right? to figure out if it is, they have a question for home office. And the question is, is this document still classified? Because they don't they don't know if it's real or not, right? So, uh, but it says that uh, they received the document from redacted, 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 uh, claims that an individual at the school whom he f refuses to name gave it to him, claiming he received it in the mail. So this, this document showed up in, in the mail and gave was passed on to somebody else at a school and then somebody at the school uh in in texas somewhere is, is brought it to the attention of the fbi and the fbi is like well, we don't know if this is true or not so they sent it in to home office right so um the the dallas office notes that within the last six weeks there have been uh, lo local publicity regarding Operation Majestic 12 with at least two appearances of a local radio talk show discussing the Majestic 12 operation, the individuals involved, and the government's attempt to keep it all secret. It is unknown if this is all part of a publicity campaign. Um, redacted from OSI advises that Operation Blue Book mentioned in the document on page four did exist. So they have this question just to ask if it uh, has been properly declassified. And as we scroll down to see the, the documents, it, it has just got bogus written on every page in big black letters. I gotta wait for the thing to load, but yeah, I know it's just kind of funny. This is bogus, bogus, bogus. But uh, so the document, top secret, Majestic 12, says eyes only, top secret, copy one of one, 
Uh, subject is Operation Majestic 12 Preliminary Briefing to President-Elect Eisenhower. Document uh, prepared 16 November 1952. Briefing Officer, Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter. Note, this document has been prepared as a preliminary briefing only. It should be regarded as an introductory to a full operations briefing intended to follow. And it starts off with uh, with Operation Majestic 12 as a top secret research and development intelligence operation. Um, it's kind of hard to read through the, the big bogus lettering. Uh, responsible uh, directly and only to the President of the United States. Operations of the project are carried out under the control of the Majestic 12 Group, which was established by Special Classified Executive Order of President Truman on 24 September 1947, upon recommendation by Dr. Vanner, Vannevar Bush and Secretary James Forrestal. See Attachment A. Members of the Majestic 12 group are designated as follows. Admiral Roscoe H. Hellencotter. And then it's followed by like a list of 12 other names, um, including Secretary James Forrestal, uh, Sidney Sowers, who we heard a little bit about in that clip, um, and you know, doctors, generals, uh, secretaries, admirals, right? So, um, and then we get into the the UFO crashes, right? On 24 June 1947, a civilian pilot flying over the Cascade Mountains in the state of Washington observed nine flying disc-shaped aircraft traveling in formation at a high rate of speed. Although this was not the first known sighting of such objects, it was the first to gain widespread attention in the public media. Hundreds of reports of sightings of similar objects followed. Many of these came fortrightly from highly credible military and civilian sources. Uh, something resulted in independent efforts by various different... Uh, can't see that of military to ascertain the nature and purpose of these objects in the interest of national defense. A number of witnesses were interviewed and uh, were several unsuccessful attempts to utilize aircraft in efforts to pursue reported disks in flight. Uh, public, uh, public relations bordered on near hysteria at times. Uh, in spite of these efforts, little substance was learned about the objects until a local something reported that one had crashed in a remote region of New Mexico, located approximately 75 miles northwest of Roswell Army Air Force Base. On July uh, 7, July 1947, a secret operation was begun to uh, ensure recovery of the wreckage of this object for scientific study. During the course of the operation, serial reconnaissance discovered that four small human-like beings had apparently ejected from the aircraft at something point before it exploded. Uh, three had killed something. Three had, I uh, can't see that word, uh, about two, ejected maybe, about two miles east of the wreckage site. All four were dead and badly decomposed due to action by predator, predators and uh, the elements during approximately one week period which had elapsed before their discovery. A special scientific team took charge of removing these bodies for study. See the attachment uh, O, I think that is. Uh, the wreckage of the something, sorry guys, <laughs> uh, it was removed to several different locations. Um, civilian military witnesses in the area were debriefed, and news reporters were given the effective cover story that the object had been a misguided weather research balloon. It's just swamp gas, guys. Um, and then uh, there was a part about them. It's not a horribly long document. Um, 
but I don't I don't want to sit here and, and read the, the whole thing, especially since it's redacted and got bogus written all over it. It's kind of hard to, to see, but I'll include it in the links in case you guys want to do some more digging. So yeah, that's a uh, Dylan Cotter is 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 connected to to um UFOs in that uh you know, he was part of allegedly, right, part of this team investigating the Roswell crash crash, which uh, is interesting because given that he was a, a kind of an expert in language, right, there was a bunch of writing, some kind of script right, that they found on the wreckage. So, I don't know, it just makes sense to have a language expert to try and, uh, you know, decipher this alien script, like it would be handy handy to have, right? Xenolinguistics 101, right? So, um, that about does it for the class, I think. Uh, I'm just going to scroll through Azazel here. Oh, um, I was going to just bring up the whole Gary McKinnon thing. How familiar are you? How much do you know about Gary McKinnon? Adam? A lot. Yeah. A lot. He's a hero of mine. Yeah. Uh, Ashburgers hacked into uh, NASA and government systems when he was like 13 or 14 years old. And um, up until uh, very, very recently here within the last uh, few years, they were trying to extradite him to the U.S. to face charges. Yep. Uh, pretty serious for just a kid hacking in and saying things like, oh, yeah, you guys have, you know, a space force. And um, do you know why he he hacked in originally? Uh, no, I don't. I don't know what his motives were, but I do know. I just found it interesting that the British prime minister basically stepped in and said, no, we're not yep. going to extradite him because he's going to kill himself if this happens. Yeah, he no, he was on suicide watch. It was it was really bad. They were purposely, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, a Julian Assange um, type thing. You know, they Very were just similar. trying to be yeah. um, rude, make him want to die. Uh, but what's interesting is I forget her name, but there was a um, person who worked in NASA, a woman who had stated that she was uh, airbrushing out ufos from images at the launch pads that when they were launching um you know into space that regularly there were ufos that were showing up and in hearing this story he decided he was going to go in and see if he couldn't find the original photos to which he says he did and uh, to understand this he was hacking in um in a day and time when it was a 56k dial-up modem so to download these large files and images and not get caught you know, being, uh, you know, on systems for extended periods of times with activity where, you know, if nobody's watching, nobody's watching. But as soon as somebody sees what you're doing, you know, you're screwed. So he wasn't able to pull out like downloads of tons of good data, but he was able to view um, this stuff over the connection. So um, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I think there is so much true. Again, why would you fight so hard for this kid if, you know, to to bring him back and charge him if if there's nothing to what he says? And it got chased all the way up to the top, the very top of his government. Yeah, apparently he had also hacked some Dyson files out at the same time he was accessed. accessed. Well, I don't know what you mean by Dyson files. Like, uh, um, okay, you've heard of a Dyson sphere, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Freeman Dyson or the, the vacuum cleaners, right? Dyson, that. Oh, no, I'm a huge fan of the guy who does that company. Don't get me started. Yeah, so Freeman John Dyson was you know, a UK Englishman, right? But uh, I'm just, there's tons of information on this is Azel News thing, but apparently Dyson Rings uh, solar, okay. So yeah, breakaway, breakaway civilizations, uh, secret space programs, um, all of these, uh, Dyson would be another wizard, actually, I would say, uh, has to do with uh, interstellar travel. Maybe we'll dive into, I mean, we're going to continue doing these profiles just for a little bit anyway, just because this is super interesting information, um, in my opinion, anyway, but uh, we've covered gold, red, 
and blue so far, so that just leaves green. And I haven't really picked a green wizard yet. Um, Nathaniel Bowditch comes to mind, possibly. Um, I'll do some more research, and next time we convene, let's just plan on doing another profile in green wizardry to wrap up uh, an overview of the four factions. Um, and then I did want to hit back on some more of the the gold faction aligned uh, wizards, just because you could say that this this uh, this show is gold faction funded. But uh, speaking speaking of that in consciousness, Adam, did you have any last minute uh, any additions to to the silver segment before we move on to? The... I can't think of any. Okay. So yeah, speaking of of spirit and consciousness and dimensions and and free will um the sword segment let's uh taking a step back out of the silver segment and uh re-centering ourselves um you know kind of absorbing all this information which may be new to us let's uh let's remind ourselves that we you know we're, we're the ones in charge still right so uh no fear here guys right um and so for this this episode's sword segment we're going to be continue reading from uh, neville goddard's the power of awareness we've made it all the way to chapter five now uh, this is a maybe two pages super short um it is entitled the truth that sets you free the drama of life is a psychological one in which all the conditions, circumstances, and events of your life are brought to pass by your assumptions. Since your life is determined by your assumptions, you are forced to recognize the fact that you are either a slave to your assumptions or their master. To become the master of your assumptions is the key to undreamed of freedom and happiness. You can attain this mastery by deliberate conscious control of your imagination. You determine your assumptions in this way. Form a mental image, a picture of the state desired, of the person you want to be. Concentrate your attention upon the feeling that you are already that person. First, visualize the picture in your consciousness then feel yourself to be in that state as though it actually formed your surrounding world. By your imagination, that which was a mere mental image is changed into a seemingly solid reality. The great secret is a controlled imagination and a well-sustained attention, firmly and repeatedly focused on the object to be accomplished. It cannot be emphasized too much that, by creating an ideal within your mental sphere, by assuming that you are already that ideal, you identify yourself with it and therefore transform yourself into its image. This was called by the ancient teachers subjection to the will of God, or resting in the Lord. And the only true test of resting in the Lord is that all who do rest are inevitably transformed into the image of that in which they rest. You become according to your resigned will, and your resigned will is your concept of yourself and all that you consent to and accept as true. You, assuming the feeling of your wish fulfilled, and continuing therein, take upon yourself the results of that state. Not assuming the feeling of your wish fulfilled, you are ever free of the results. Which is not what we're going for, right? <laughs> uh, when you understand the redemptive function of imagination, you hold in your hands the key to the solution of all your problems. Every phase of your life is made by the exercise of your imagination. Determined imagination alone is the means of your progress, of the fulfilling of your dreams. It is the beginning and end of all creating. 
The great secret is a controlled imagination and a well-sustained attention firmly and repeatedly focused on the feeling of the wish fulfilled until it fills the mind and crowds all other ideas out of consciousness. What greater gifts could be given you than to be told the truth that will set you free? John 8.32 The truth that sets you free is that you can experience in imagination what you do sorry the truth that sets you free is that you can experience in imagination what you desire to experience in reality and by maintaining this experience in imagination your desire will become an actuality you are limited only by your uncontrolled imagination and lack of attention to the feeling of your wish fulfilled when the imagination is not controlled and the attention not steadied on the feeling of the wish fulfilled, then no amount of prayer or piety or invocation will produce the desired effect. When you can call up at will whatsoever image you please, when the forms of your imagination are as vivid to you as the forms of nature, you are master of your fate. You must stop spending your thoughts, your time, and your money. Everything in life must be an investment. He ends with a poem by Dr. George W. Carey called The New Name. Visions of beauty and splendor, forms of a long-lost race, sounds and faces and voices from the fourth dimension of space, and on through the universe boundless, our thoughts go lightning shod, some call it imagination and others call it God. I like the little poetry bits that he sprinkles into his writings. Um, later on, he gets it really heavily into William Blake, which I appreciate. If I remember the, that poet's name correctly. But uh, yeah, super short reading for our silver segment, or I'm sorry, our sword segment tonight. Uh, Neville does a great job, I think, of uh, putting uh, the power back into our minds, right? Our own hands of reminding us that we're able to do this, right? And um, I mean, doing some remote viewing is also a very good uh, good uh, practice to, uh, good, um, how, you, how would you say it? Um, confidence booster right ability enhancer um you name it like it's just it's good stuff so uh, but speaking uh, of good stuff and of free good stuff no less uh, do not forget to sign up for the free scalar energy session that mystical wares provides uh, every week on fridays there is a uh free session you can sign up for all you have to do is go to the website which is linked in the show notes and uh, find the scalar energy or the scalar healing uh, page it's the link is provided for you and you just click the sign up here uh, button and uh, go through the steps like you're checking out but since it's free you're checking out with zero dollars so this is essentially just to put your name in the bucket so to speak which may be more literal than you think, because I think the way that there's a picture of, of the machine on the site, and I think the names just get placed in between the the two uh, parts of it with all the other names, right? So it could be a literal bucket, right? <laughs> but uh, every week there's a different a different session or a different uh, theme, I guess, uh, the area that we target, and this week's uh, theme will, will like. Friday's theme will be uh, digestion and gut health. Uh, so once again, that is a free service. Uh, sign up for it. Uh, write me an email after the session is done and let me know if you noticed anything weird go on, right? Uh, we wouldn't mind hearing uh, from any of our listeners, actually. Uh, speaking of, um, we would uh, I would ask that uh, you would rate the show if, if you're if, if possible, right, using whatever platform that you are on. Um, 
we've come to the point now in in the uh, the program where uh, normally a lot of other people would ask for your donations, right? Well, I do not have to do that, and I'm super grateful that I don't have to do that. We have a sponsor that takes care of all the bills, right? So um, all I ask is that you share the show, really, and um, help spread the love any way that you can. And uh, yeah, until next time, Chrononauts. Carpe diem.